The text for our devotion this evening is taken from Luke chapter 22, verse 66. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. The word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. She rushed out of the school through the cold drizzle into the warmth of her mom's car. And as she was taking off her winter hat, she caught something out of the corner of her eye. There, floating motionless, just inches from her face, was her little brother's hand. And she was about to turn to him and teach him a lesson when he said, I'm not touching you. And it was true. He wasn't touching her. What, what could she do? She was helpless. He was doing nothing wrong. All right. You and I both know that technically not doing anything wrong is not the same as flat out not doing anything wrong. The boy's attitude was, was all wrong. He was bending the rules with, with one goal in mind. He was trying to annoy his big sister, and it was working. Let's call this a semblance of legality. It takes a little bit more explanation. Okay, so the, the little brother said, I'm not touching you. And he wanted to portray himself as this sweet, innocent little boy who does exactly what his parents say, but it was all to cover up the fact that he was breaking his parents' rule in order to not do what his parents wanted him to do. This evening, we're going to take a look at the the technicalities, the outward rule-keeping, the semblances of legality that led our Savior to the cross. And it begins with a little bit of backstory that, that picks up uh, right where our, our passion reading. Then seizing Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Jesus was there in the garden late at night in seclusion when this band of armed thugs comes to arrest him. Now, this wasn't just your, your friendly neighborhood policemen just doing their job. And there were no uh, friendly crowds around to witness this and object to what was happening. No, this was a, a well-organized endeavor to quietly, quickly, and discreetly take Jesus out of the picture, orchestrated by none other than Judas. And when they finally had Jesus arrested, where did they take him? Not to a jail cell where Jesus could await a trial by jury of his peers. No, they took him to the house of the high priest. There they interrogated him. They brought false witnesses against him. They accused him of blasphemy. They mocked him. They beat him. But was this a trial? No, no, of course not. You'd be mistaken because it would be illegal for them to have a trial in the middle of the night at a place that was different from their normal place of meeting when some of Jesus' key supporters weren't able to make it. No, that, that would be illegal. This was just a, a meeting with the high priest. The writer of the book, The Crucial Hours, notes, they were extremely anxious to keep a semblance of legality. So early in the morning, at daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. They thought that Jesus was a threat to their power. They wanted him gone. But they also wanted to hold on to what little shred of authority they had. And so trying to seize this fleeting moment, this opportunity where they could get rid of Jesus, they held this official trial for him, but the verdict had already been decided. They broke the rules in the middle of the night, and then they held this charade so that nobody could accuse them of corruption, so that nobody could know what was going on. I mean, this, this happens all the time in history. It happens in movies, the owner of a company, the founder of the company, comes into the board meeting only to find that they met in secret without him and they kicked him out. 
These are the religious leaders of Israel. We shouldn't be too surprised. Their actions are right in line with their understanding of theology. They believed that if you wanted to please God, it didn't really matter what was going on in your heart. It didn't really matter what your motivations were. As long as, as, long as outwardly it looked like you were doing the right thing. So for example... It didn't really matter if you were sincerely worshiping God on the Sabbath day, as long as nobody caught you working. It didn't really matter if you were taking care of your elderly parents, just just as long as you took that money and you dedicated it to God instead. And so it didn't really matter if Jesus was innocent or guilty. It didn't really matter if the trial the night before had been illegal, just as long as then the next morning they went through the uh, proper channels. Is this mockery of a coarse case what we are to blame for our Savior's crucifixion? It is one outward step on the path Jesus took to the cross. But Jesus didn't have to be there. A little due process wouldn't have changed. This, this court had no power over Jesus. If we want to find the semblance of legality that led to his death, we are going to have to look elsewhere. But we're not going to have to look very far. Look no further than the man before you. Look no further than your own heart. I often, you know, we we may wonder and question who did they think they were fooling, but then And we also have to ask ourselves, who do I think I'm fooling? How often I have been more preoccupied with a semblance of legality than actually pleasing God. How often I'm more interested in appearing to do the right thing than than actually doing it. And so I'll go to church every Sunday and, and that just gives me a little bit more leeway to do whatever I want the rest of the week. As long as I'm smiling with somebody, it doesn't really matter how I feel on the inside. We may be able to fool everyone else into thinking that we are a good person, but we can't fool God. He sees our performance for what it is, an act. He knows us as we really are. Sinners through and through, inside and out, and dead because of it. He he sees the injustices that we commit sees the uncaring attitude that lies just beneath the surface of all our outwardly caring actions. He sees it all. That is what led Jesus to the cross. Jesus didn't have to be there. I'm sure even without using an an ounce of his divine power, he could have pointed out how the, the trial was a farce. I'm sure he could have argued with Pilate and defended himself. I'm sure he could have rallied up his supporters into a fury until they let him go, or or maybe even rallied them into a rebellion and overthrown all the corrupt officials ruling over him. But he didn't. Because that wasn't his father's will. So Jesus endured this trial all the way to the cross. God knows us as we really are, but he also knows Jesus as he really is. He, he knows Jesus' outward actions, whether it was keeping the Passover or, or healing a man's ear. Jesus did everything just the way he was supposed to, and, and God also knows Jesus' heart. The reason behind those actions was not, not to appear good before other people. Jesus loved his neighbors because he really loved his neighbors. Jesus preached to sinners because he really loved sinners. And it is that love for sinners that led Jesus to the cross. That is what led him to take our, the, the injustice of our justice, what was supposed to be for us. See, the, what Jesus faced was not just some semblance of legality so God could brush, his, uh, brush our sins aside like they were nothing. There, on Calvary, the full 
force of God's justice was handed out on Jesus. The, the only real innocent one was tru- truly suffered for those who truly deserve to suffer. The living one really was executed for those who truly deserve to die. He was pierced for our transgressions and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. God knows Jesus did this for you in your place that you could have his perfection. So we don't have to be striving over after this semblance of legality. We don't have to be putting on an outward performance of hollow, empty, outward actions and righteousness. We can come together just as we are honest with God and with one another, and we gather together at the foot of the cross, and there we find real holiness through Christ. And so we can strive for something something higher, something better. We can strive for obedience to God that comes from the heart. You're pushed out into a a brightly lit courtroom, hands cuffed together, You've just been caught. And you, you know what you've done, and soon everybody else there will too. And in fact, the jury's already eyeing you with some shame and su- suspicion. They're not really making eye contact with you. The prosecution feels that the case is so open and shut that they're making lighthearted conversation with the people behind them. They've got stacks of evidence on their table. Their lawyer catches you staring and, and gives you a devilish wink and a smile. In walks your lawyer. In a nice cream-colored suit, he's calm, cool, and collected. He sits down and opens his briefcase containing your defense, and and you you just bury your hands in your face. A single sheet of paper, that's all I've got. The prosecution gets going. They call you up to the stand. They begin to show one by one each and every one of your crimes. One by one, they prove that it... You were there. You did it. It was you. There's no alibi. By the time they finished their, their hour-long cross-examination, one of the jurors is, is openly weeping. And then your lawyer stands up, gives you a reassuring smile. Your Honor, he begins, my client couldn't have done those crimes because I did them. Time stand still. The court is absolutely silent, and then things happen really quickly. All of a sudden, the gavel is falling, the the case is over. All of a sudden, your hands are are free, and you're rubbing your now uncuffed, aching wrists as they're being, the handcuffs are being slapped on your lawyer. All of a sudden, they're handing you a a set of new clothes to, to replace your prison uniform. All of a sudden, they're releasing you, and your lawyer is being led away like a lamb to the slaughter. This Lent, as we focus on these crucial moments that led Jesus to the cross, let's not think about them through a filter of, of righteous anger at corrupt officials. Let's not think about them through a, a sadness of, of injustice that, of the injustices that Jesus faced. And may these moments help us to, to repent of our corruption. May they help us to see my injustices. And then may we see these moments for what they are. Crucial moments of our Savior's love and grace. Amen. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Please stand.